Hey, thanks for joining. This is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat. And I'm here today with Anand. Hey, great to have you. Thank you, Christian. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. Yeah, so for folks that don't know you, why don't you introduce who you are, what you do, where you are? Sure. So hello from sunny Florida. Uh, my name is Adnan. I am a chief architect for artificial intelligence and machine learning for a company named USC Global. It's a consulting services and products company. I am also a Microsoft MVP and a Microsoft regional director, a newly minted one. Uh, my MVP is in artificial intelligence. That is my area of focus. Uh, before uh, becoming uh, an AI-focused uh, MVP and architect, I used to work in uh, financial technology space where I built a lot of uh, large scale systems with MasterCard. I used to work for a startup called Green Dot. It's no longer a startup. It's a billion dollar company. But um, that was my, my specialty in building microservices and cloud-based architectures. So I have, uh, that's, uh, that's what I used to do. I'm also uh, visiting a scholar at Stanford University. I work with Chris Manning, Dr. Chris Manning's group. Uh, for natural language processing and understanding. So I manage for my company uh, this relationship between MIT and Stanford academic relationship that's called the Alliance Program uh, along with that. So that gives me uh, what I like to call as an intersection between academia and industry. So uh, my PhD is in machine learning. I try to take the uh, exciting products built at, at academia, uh, especially the Stanford AI lab, which is the birthplace of Google, and try to apply that here at um, uh, in industry in various variety of sectors. So I work closely with retail, finance, and healthcare. These are the three key areas and try to bring in the latest and greatest from uh, academia in terms of anomaly detection on or predictive analytics or deep learning and then try to apply that. So that's like a, a brief introduction to things I do. You know, so I have a former uh, business partner. I had a, a consulting company when I was living in Northern California who was also a visiting scholar at uh, at Stanford, very very smart young man. Uh, he's now a, uh, a, a Stanford put him through uh, law school, and um, wow. uh, you know it, you know you're a certain level of smart where Stanford pays you to go to school at their university. Um, but he uh, so but he uh, uh, is now a, a practicing patent attorney uh, and worked for Google for years. And uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Michael Meehan, um, but we worked at some startups together um, back uh, 25, was that long ago? 25, 30 years ago? Wow, it's a long time. <laughs> 25, 20, yeah, like 20 years ago. Okay, yeah, it's not. How old were you back then? 16? Yeah, I'm not that old. So I was in, yeah, so I met him when in my early 30s. Um, so, um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so it's, it, it's, uh, I have to say that, I mean, having that relationship and that, so that startup that I did with, with um, Michael, uh, the great thing about that was the relationship that we had with Stanford and UC Berkeley. So a lot of clients that came through that, we worked with a number of faculty members uh, in, in, in high tech. And so for, as a consultant to uh, work with a lot of these newly funded, you know, uh, venture backed uh, startups. Uh, it was it was fascinating just to be at that time and that location and be associated with those two schools uh, and, and just feel like you know we weren't creating those technologies and we weren't formally part of those startups, but we got to hobnob with them and 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 hear kind of the formation stories of of these. It's just a very exciting time. So I enjoyed those years as uh, with that company. So. Uh, I, yeah, it's I exciting to be in that environment. Yeah, it's like you, just the energy in there, like Stanford AI Lab, you are walking and you see Dr. Faith Ali. She is the one of the leading uh, figures in machine learning and deep learning and she, the computer vision. She is the person in computer vision. Then you see like Joe Leskovich, who is the chief architect at Pinterest. You see like uh, Chris Manning, who is the leading figure. Like the books, you read their books in graduate studies or undergrad. And then you meet these guys. Um, and, and they're guys just, I'm assuming they're, they're just hanging around. They like the cafeteria. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are very uh, easy to, easily accessible. Yeah. Christopher yeah. Ray, he sold uh, his uh, company. He built this deep learning platform, which actually is used for detecting human trafficking. 
pattern. So, so it's actually used, for, yeah, it's funded by Darpa. It's used, it's a, it's a very fascinating case study if you look at, uh, uh, that it's called, um, uh, it is, I'm blanking on the name of it, but uh, Christopher Ray, uh, he, he built this uh, whole platform around uh, looking up dark data and then it's uh, it's a, a company which was which came out of it. Netify was sold to Apple for like I think close to three hundred million dollars. And yeah. you just see him walking around. So yeah, these guys. Sebastian Thurn is another one of the guys. Uh, James Zhao, Dr. James Zhao. So uh, it's like and same in MIT. Like you will see all these luminaries, and it's fascinating to work with them. Well, that's very cool. Yeah, the um, and I know there's a lot going on. I was just thinking too. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that Microsoft added uh, artificial intelligence as uh, as a, a domain, as an area for MVPs. Are you one of the first AI MVPs or or was it around longer? I, I was, wasn't it like four or five years ago when they introduced it? Was it longer? Uh, not to my understanding. No, it's, it's about three years. So I, I was one of the first MVPs. Okay. Originally the, the first batch was around uh, 46 people. And I think Microsoft Research has been in the forefront of this area for a long time. They have done a lot of work in, in that area. From an implementations perspective, you can see a lot of early products came out of MSR. And yeah. uh, Azure has adopted it earlier. So uh, I think from an MVP perspective, I guess it was not as early as it could have been. But it, it was right away, as soon as the products starts coming out, it became an area. Like you quantum computing, now you see is a quantum as an MVP is, uh, is also available. Yep. So an Azure ecosystem is fairly mature now when it comes to ML ops and uh, machine learning implementations around both reinforcement learning, deep learning, and machine learning capabilities, yeah. Well, I know, so, so you talk about that. It, it, I think that was exactly my point. I mean, the, it came later, but Microsoft has been doing things for many years. I mean, back when I, so I left in 2009, I used to go to the, um, over in building 99, um, the where where Microsoft Research was primarily based. I don't know where if they're spread out or they still, you know, in that that yeah. building. But I used to go to their their demonstrations. So they would basically they do these presentations of uh, you know, a bunch of things that they're working on, and they were fantastic. And of course, they brought in other guest speakers. They did other events. But it's really fascinating to see in the audience. And sometimes. And I would, be, I was over at the time I was in uh, online services, I was over in Microsoft advertising. Um, but just to hear more about these other pure R&D efforts that are, that are going on and uh, uh, sitting around me were a lot of the product team. So like the office folks, you know, that hearing about it for the first time too, which, which actually kind of surprised me. That's a different topic like that that R&D and research could be so disconnected from uh, what the, and I know you want your research team to be disconnected because they're, they're out thinking things up and, and building things. It could take years to do that before you th start thinking about productizing those. Uh, but it just seems like there could have been uh, tighter integration, which is again what the labs tried to do. But that, again, that's a longer story. But uh, I guess, so my question is, uh, that I'm finally getting to, uh, is around, uh, you know, what are some of the things that, that you know, have come up within the Microsoft ecosystem in you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning space? Yeah, that's a question which may require a show of its own. Uh, but <laughs> if you look at MSR in general, the things came out of it. You remember 2009 and 10 era, they had Infra.net, which is an inference framework from Vision Inference. And it actually has like a bunch of different inference capabilities. Uh, there's Pros.net, which is actually a program building by examples. Uh, there is a lot of machine learning models and deep learning models which came out of that research in, in general. And uh, there is a lot of work which went into the back end for Azure, for example, data center monitoring for the power consumption, uh, predictive analytics based on that usage perspective, the anomaly detection outlier analysis. So I think uh, based on my understanding, and again, you were there, so you probably know better than I do, uh, there was a tighter integration in certain groups. For example, with Office Group, there was a lot of integration. Delft, for example, Microsoft Delft actually came out of the MSR. Uh, there was, and then maybe in some other groups, there was not as much. Uh, one of the, I guess, key uh, things you can see is uh, from academia or research to uh, applied 
implementation pipeline, you can see a lot of things in terms of uh, products which are coming up, like computer vision, the entire cognitive services part of the things that uh, is, is part outcome from there. Uh, there is also, uh, of course, your whole uh, deep learning landscape around uh, CNTK, rest in peace. Uh, <laughs> there's a few uh, uh, things which uh, uh, came out over there. I think one of uh, my favorite uh, things which came out of uh, MSR uh, in terms of that is uh, the language models. I and mean, you probably have been hearing about the language models. So you have birds and animals of the world and the, the transformer models. So if you look at the language models transformation, so I work closely in NLP and that's something which is near and dear to my heart. We used to work with like bag of word models and TFIDS and LDAs of the world. You know, that's uh, old school, uh, I guess, NLP and grams. And then from there we moved to a, a little bit more sophisticated models like using RNN for sequence generations that occur in neural networks. And from there we came to LFTMs, which are a bit more sophisticated than they are part of RNN, but uh, class, but it's a bit more sophisticated. And now we are uh, switched to this transformer models, which are almost like magic. Right? So you can predict what a person is going to, what, what a text is going to say, uh, or you can generate sequences. You can do comprehension on documents, which is magical. You can understand documents without any prior knowledge. Uh, it's just trained on large Wikipedia, uh, pretty, pretty much the entire internet. <laughs> and then it understands in an unsupervised manner how close two concepts can be together, together. Like for example, if you ask who is the protagonist in Matrix or who is the hero in Matrix or who is, uh, who is uh, the leading actor in Matrix, all of these concepts are closely aligned together in a high vector dimension space. So you don't have to train the synonym. It knows the synonym. It knows the concept hierarchy. The, the transformer network. So you can just put a PDF document and ask questions around it. So Microsoft has just recently released a, a, a much larger transformer model. And I think that's one of the things which is uh, very elegant about uh, that, that solution that it can actually work in a supervised manner. There are certain challenges in terms of uh, ethical AI and operationalizing those models. Uh, you probably remember that whole uh, debacle around uh, by an open AI decided not to release one of the models. But it's uh, it's fascinating that space is moving. And of course, it's not without its challenges, especially in the day and age we are living. The importance of ethical AI can never be understated. Yeah, I know that you've, uh, I, you know, I saw in your status that you've been talking about that a lot recently. And that's been, I know it's something that Satya has brought up. Um, of course, there was the, uh, what was the, the name? Is it was the, um, uh, the, the Cortana like experience. It was the, you know, the, the bot, the AI per persona that Microsoft put out there. Okay. And within, within hours, it became racist. I mean, it's just, just crazy fast that it, it went and, and people were able to, based on questions that was being asked and, and, and uh, you know, down, down the, uh, the uh, I know, the, the, the rat hole that it went and looking for information, back it up around there. And if you can hear my, uh, my, my little uh, fur babies that are upstairs and I think some, the UPS guy must have uh, delivered a package, but, uh, but anyway, uh, there's, yeah, it's been fascinating. Now, I, I'm not keeping up on everything I read, a lot of the stuff that comes out. Um, I've got good friends. Uh, Naomi Moneypenny joined Microsoft a few years back, and it, she's uh, at the, the, the center of, of, like, Project Cortex and a lot of what's happening there. And so even through Naomi, before she joined Microsoft, I would hear of a lot of the developments, a lot of the efforts that are going on in that space. And just my observation as well is that there's a, a lot of shifting of roles that have happened as happens with Microsoft employees at the end of their fiscal year. And a lot of people are moving over into that space. There's a lot of Microsoft is building up a lot around AI in general. Um, but from a, from a collaboration standpoint, which is my primary focus, uh, and it, even from a uh, project portfolio management, the, the, you know, intelligent system standpoint. I mean, Project Cortex is really exciting. Um, there's there's a, just a lot of things. Anything that that uh, is around collaboration, about around knowledge management. I mean, I'm I'm very keen on seeing and hearing more about. I don't know if you're working in those spaces specifically. Do you have any other deeper insights into what Microsoft is doing there? Microsoft is doing amazing work in the AI and machine learning areas in general. So from a, uh, 
from just in looking at the document management or knowledge management, I shouldn't say. So uh, the knowledge graph structure, they have in Azure. I don't know if you have, uh, you're familiar with probably the, the, probably have seen the FBI files demo already, have you? The one, uh, so that's a, that's a fascinating demo because it's a very interesting demo and it also shows a lot of different capabilities people miss. So from a knowledge management perspective, a lot of companies right now struggle with the idea of being able to take you know, like a, like a document, like actual document, physical document. And then uh, how can you identify entities in there? And how can you extract entities out of there? Like applying OCR, so cognitive OCR. Uh, so you have this form recognizer now, which can actually do this. And uh, what is typically missed is how it can work with dynamic different degrees of forms and how fault tolerant it is. So that's a really great uh, perspective of that way so it can it can work on different dimensions of the forms and be able to read and uh, apply uh, more sophisticated uh, AI on this I'm, I'm using AI term loosely here I'm sure yeah. you're gonna get some hate mail about that but <laughs> it's, yeah. it's uh, that that's one of the areas where the knowledge management across industry is, is very valuable to be applied so insurance companies and fintech you will be surprised to see how many LLC forms get filed in a manual manner even though we have you know, all the different technologies available to do data ingestion or processing from uh, from uh, more of a computerized data or, or digital data. Uh, but there are tons of uh, use cases around that, including uh, medical records. So that solution, the Microsoft Azure and Cognitive Services solution, which actually does that data ingestion is very powerful because it does not only uh, ingest the entities, but also keep track of that as a knowledge graph, and then you can do search on it. One of the, uh, I think, uh, areas which is very powerful in you know, since we're talking about ethical AI is that Microsoft is trying to work a lot in the area of uh, the transparency of AI. So you probably have heard of Fair Learn as a toolkit being released. So it's recently being released, Fair Learn, and I think they announced it and built. Uh, don't count me on exact date time of that. But um, there's also another toolkit which came out of it called Interpret ML. And that's a part of that interpretability lightning. So the idea here is that if you are deploying a model in the cloud, how would you be able to make sure that it's uh, secure, it's uh, trustable, and it's uh, robust, and it's fair. Right? So if yep. if I build a model and I'm a, I'm a machine learning engineer, not really an SME, and I deploy it, and it may be gender biased or race biased or, or something from, from data which came in there, and I can you know say, oh, I, I didn't know about this, the data is biased. But it's as a it's my ethical responsibility or the organization responsibility, that's an AI governance thing, to understand the bias in that, and then actually report it to the SMEs and SMEs needs to see this. So this is a part of the AI life cycle. So one of the things which Microsoft has done earliest is came up with this data science life cycle called TDSP. So you probably have heard of, you know, the CRISP DM, which was used to be a back in the day uh, life cycle, CRISP DM for data mining life cycle. Right? Yep. And we have, of course, a traditional SDLCs, but data science being its own beast, the, the models training is not a one-time process, as you know. There's a feedback loop which happens. And that's what happened with Tay. Like we did, it's, it's actually a, a learning exercise. And uh, uh, if you do mini batches or you do online learning, uh, that's where you have to be careful about this. So Tay was trying to learn on the, Tay was that bot which went all xenophobic and racist right, and right. anti-Semitic. Anti yeah. yep. So it's actually, yeah, it gets coded a lot, but you know, there's another uh, horror story where uh, uh, Google, trained their their photo program to you you know that right so i'm I do. not one of the peters it's yeah, made, highly made news again right yep yeah well i know <laughs> so i know it's it's I, I always like to remind people too this is like it, 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 they bring that up i do the exact same thing i said you know there were a lot of other very public failures of, of the technology yeah. well it's it's why one of the the i i think of things like Project Cortex. And I think, hey, it's wonderful what it could be doing. For those that aren't familiar with it, you know, definitely go take a look at it. But it's this idea that it will, artificial intelligence will go and identify all of the uh, uh, like topic cards um, based on the interaction. It will go and auto provision essentially a wiki site around a project or a topic that's essential to your your organization. Well, one of my first questions, one, it's, it's still in private preview, and so none of us have actually seen it. I know people that are actively working within those, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's something that is, you know, we're, we're waiting for. I believe later this year, we're gonna see it all uh, generally available. 
But my question is, what is the curation process? What's going to be my, as an organization, as the owner in IT, as the management team, what's the oversight of what's created before it goes live to make sure it goes to that trust question that you just brought up? Right. Um, I, I, I know it can go and functionally go and build this, um, but it does need to learn. Any of this technology, it has to learn. There's going to be corrections to be made. So that curation process is essential because AI run amok has again and again and again proven that it, it, there are problems. Those biases come up, whether it's based on the data, the biases of the individuals that coded it and they just didn't think of those. Um, things that are, you know, you, you have biases that, that are cultural. If it's built by an American and isn't thinking about the global impact of some of the decisions made around that. So that curation process is essential. Um, so that's always yeah, that's right. governance, and you know that the governance is key. Yeah, and Microsoft has done a lot of initiatives around that. So there's a whole data card initiative where you can actually see ingredients of the data. So whatever is being published, uh, you know, you can see that this data was acquired from where, what kind of data set. It I'm, I'm sorry, I was just getting another call. Yeah, no worries. So you probably will have, have to cut it off or something. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the, around the, the data sets where you can actually see where the data was, was uh, received from, also where the data was, uh, 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 what kind of data diversity is in that data set, right? So yeah. that's an important right. thing. Microsoft has this whole transparency initiative around this where they talk about the, the data being, so the systems, are transparent so they can explain themselves in a way a human subject matter expert can understand and interpret the decisions they are making. And it keeps an audit trail of these things, right? So these are some of the key principles where AI governance has to be there, right? So systems are fair. So fairness is an important entity where like what is fair? And uh, then I, I don't want it to start becoming like a, a, a debate around the affirmative action, but there are certain biases, like you said, are already negative and they are existing in the data sets. So the, the problem with uh, machine learning based system is that it can perpetuate the bias. So from a human bias perspective, you can train humans and then you know, uh, put go, uh, standards around this to say, okay, you cannot discriminate based on gender, you cannot discriminate based on race or faith or uh, you know, sexual orientation or, or protected classes. But if these biases get ingrained into the machine learning systems, they are perpetuating and that's really dangerous. I mean, this is a terminator scenario we have. And a lot of people uh, talk about it. I actually have like a whole uh, set of books right here, uh, exactly on, on this topic. Uh, I'm working on some specific point of views around this. This is one of the most favorite books I have. It's Weapons of Math Destruction. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's, uh, it's by uh, an author. She's a math PhD. And uh, she, Kathy O'Neill, and she talks about this. So this is a, a brilliant book around this. Uh, there's one called Technically Wrong. I guess I'm going to show off my library over yeah. here. <laughs> I, I, so I, it's, it's for those that are you know, watching or listening into it, I do require all of my guests to bring uh, suggested re reading material. So I appreciate it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, do, I do the I same thing. Love, so, yeah. You do? Uh, yeah, I, I yeah. love that. But like, it's, it's good stuff to share. So it's like, this is very interesting. Algorithms of oppression. Uh, hmm. She is actually like, I started this thing called Algorithm, Algorithm Justice League. Uh, and uh, it's it's a very interesting concept. She was one of the original outspoken people against the algorithmic bias. So going back to the Microsoft's uh, role in that area, right? They talk about the bias and then how you can make systems fair. So the key things like transparency, ensuring the security against adversarial attacks, because that's a very common theme now. That adversarial attacks happen on the on these AI systems and they can cause issues. So how you will make sure that. Uh, doesn't happen. Um, uh, the least, latest uh, scandal in AI, I don't know if you're following it or not, there's a paper published called, by, called Pulse and it's, uh, the idea is you can have a small thumbnail and if you extend the thumbnail, it will make a proper picture right. based on the most uh, closest picture it can be. So it was trained on a data set which was uh, predominantly uh, white Caucasian. So when you take a small thumbnail, of President Barack Obama and expanded, it became 
uh, a person, uh, it, it didn't say a person of color, but it became a white person in that picture, a very light skinned person. So that blew up uh, as a big issue that in, this is exactly the problem with artificial intelligence. You, are, you guys are completely doing this wrong. You should have done this. So uh, one of the leading researchers, uh, Turing Award winner, by the way, he, he won the Turing Award last year with uh, Joshua Bengio and uh, Jeffrey Hinton, uh, Yan Likun. Uh, spoke out about that, and Yan Lukun said that you know it's because the data training data was uh, was predominantly Caucasian. If you do it somewhere else with a different type of data set, it will come out different. So everybody thought of that as an excuse, saying, "Oh, you are just blaming the data. You're not blaming." And and I agree, there's controls need to be put in place for this. And I think because uh, the AI and machine learning is in its infancy and it's starting out, there needs to be something uh, to put in place. I think uh, uh, a lot of people speak about this problem. Uh, where Google released their uh, their uh, word to vec model, where what happens is, if you ask for synonym, if you ask, let, let me let me quiz you on that, okay? So blue is to boy, girl is to pink. Pink. There you go. So model learn from the data set, right? I know these are kind of questions you have to think a little bit more about right. <laughs> before you answer <laughs> them. Uh, they get very tricky. So that's, these synonyms are already learned by these models because they are trained on large data set and they see the frequency of occurrence of these texts very close together. So they are like, okay, this is how it works. But it becomes uh, you know, bad really fast. For example, uh, man is to doctor as woman is to? Nurse. Right. I, and I'm doing, I'm doing it. And, and just folks, I'm not doing that because I believe that it's like, look, you know, they, they I'm, I'm, they, I, I'm, all I'm doing is repeating what the stereotypical response is for that. So exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, you, you so have that's set me up. <laughs> I did set you up. Uh, <laughs> no, but I, so you know, I, I think this is a great point. Cause so I'm, I'm good friends with uh, the founder of a company uh, in Redmond, Washington, that actually works very closely a lot of their projects uh, with Microsoft. And their core technology is providing the data that goes into all of the beautiful demos that you see of whatever the products are. So they're, they've created technology to create vast amounts of data and populate um, like, a, 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 like when the Microsoft Teams launch happened and they're showing all these demos and being able to show you analytical reports to show that it was actually has been used for six months and and all this kind of stuff it's not hey it's not 120 people that have for the last six months done a bunch of fake data within teams just so that they could provide a pretty report for this demo no they they went and they populated this data but i could see how you know here they are populating demo systems they provide this as a service um to technology companies, how that they're populating, they're, they're extending a lot of those biases just through that, that automation. So it's a, it's just something that they need to go in and, and think about, Hey, we need to make sure that we are truly providing a, um, you know, a, a, a globally consumable service. They're limiting themselves, but even with their customers, you know, Microsoft needs to make sure that the data that they're using in their demos fits their broadest of constituencies of this, they're a global company. Um, anyway, it, it, but it is, it's, it's fascinating when you, you think about that. I, you yeah. know, and I think sometimes we, my opinion here is that we so quickly jump on the case and attack the, the people like in this example, um, you know, the companies that go and attempt to build this new technology and the biases are shown. I think that there needs to be some, some room, some space given to companies to recognize, hey, we need to go and make adjustments and fine tune this. Um, we had, you know, three, uh, you know, white American, uh, you know, one Asian American, you know, code this and the, like, don't get upset if it doesn't fit every geographical constituency of who we're trying to market to. Um, that's who built this product. Now we need to think about how do we need to expand that? Yeah, I agree. Safest space to experiment. You have to have a safest space to experiment. Otherwise, what's the, what's the alternative? People are not going to stop experimenting and building these models. What you're doing is just putting them in a place where they are not going to publish the results. And then people who are going to start using the models, it, it's essentially making it a you know, back alley experimentation. Right. Which is, and, and, and imagine like larger companies uh, have the capability to actually 
do these experiments and publish reports, but the smaller companies don't have that capability to actually uh, do all of those experiments or even publish the reports around the diversity of the data set, et cetera. So having a mechanism around that is important, as important as you have uh, the other aspects of this. So uh, I, I was uh, going to talk to you about uh, AI governance as standard, but uh, one thing you brought up is the building of dynamic taxonomy with a project cortex. I think that's a pretty fascinating idea, and I'm looking forward to getting a into the area of public data as soon as they, they come into there. I mean, I'm, yeah, I, I'm I just, sure. what, so what, what was the name of the failed Microsoft AI? What was that, the, that, the uh, persona's Tay. name? Sorry? Tay, T-A-Y, Tay, Tay, Microsoft Oh, Tay, Tay. that's right. So I yes. hope we don't have another Tay experience with it gone, gone live, but it's, uh, it might be why it's uh, taking a little bit longer since they've, we've been hearing about it for a year, year and a half uh, for it to come out, but, uh, yeah, that, but that's why, again, I go, my default is, you know, what is the governance? What is the, what is the uh, curation process and what is change management going to look like for that, um, for that solution within an enterprise? So I'm, I'm excited to see it um, and kick the tires. Um, I, I'm, uh, I, I think that we need to, I don't know, you know, kind of temper our expectations uh, around these things, okay. it has to take time to learn and and adjust. And it, no matter how robust it appears when they when it becomes generally available or or, or expanded uh, preview of that, whatever the next step is, uh, it also has to learn from our usage of it, our organization. So I think to your point, I mean, it, it may then go and uncover things that uh, are the norm that are part of the culture of our organization that we need to change as well. So uh, I, I think it's, it's fascinating stuff. I, I think we just need to be more lenient or understanding and have a little more empathy for the organizations to know that, hey, sometimes when, uh, here's a great way to, to bring this up. So SharePoint experience, I come from that background. Um, when Microsoft acquired Fast Search and started incorporating the technology into the platform. SharePoint uh, 2010, uh, when that finally came out and was incorporated in, it wasn't a separate server license. It was actually the technology was integrated into SharePoint, the general release. We heard from customers all the time. There's like, well, search is broken. As we would go in and work with them to try and uncover what's happening, search wasn't broken. It was starting to work. And because it was working properly, it was now surfacing poor data management. It was surfacing poor taxonomy and metadata usage. So they were sloppy with their data and it was uncovering that. And so they had, uh, you know, the cleanup permissions and cleanup taxonomy and metadata and all kind of all those different things. I think that Cortex and this and AI technology is doing the same thing. It's, it, it's not that there is some, uh, uh, you know, the, the organizations going out there trying to um, be racist or unethical in its behavior around the data. I think it, it, we're, we're going to need to further refine our systems and our data so that um, it, it is more accurately representing who we are as companies. You, you bring up a very excellent point. And I think that's, I, I usually say that uh, without a tongue in cheek reference is that AI is going to make us more human because it, it discovers our biases, right? So you will see a recidivism use case. So that's a huge problem. And that's why I can see the point of view from other people when I talk about safe space to be able to research and experiment. A recidivism is not definitely not a place where you will be playing with these kind of things, right? Because that is playing with lights. Like who is gonna get parole and who is not going to get parole if that is going to get decided based on a machine learning algorithm, we have to make sure that there is no, not much room for bias in there. Right. Because that's, a, that's a, who gets to go to college, who gets to get a loan, who gets, so there, there are some life-changing, high-impact decision-making processes which, where we have to do our uh, ultimate best, right? But if, when it comes to movie recommendation, if uh, Christian really likes uh, rom-coms and he gets recommended, you know, a horror movie, then that's not the end of the world. Yeah. But if I am being recommended a specific hospital because I'm a person of a minority or a color, and that actually happened in New York, uh, is a large healthcare company who was sending people of color to a specific hospital and not getting the right treatment. And that's bad, right? So that's where 
the AI, AI governance is definitely needs to be there. So that's the point of which uh, other organizations could bring into play. But the, the point you brought up in diversity and inclusion, I think from a, uh, the area you specifically work on in terms of communication and coordination and how the inter-organization communication work and what are the tools and frameworks around that, I think DNI, specifically in the framework of AI, can be a huge, huge uh, application. So for example, thinking about how do different people incorporate and is there any sort of uh, the, the click making or the conversation you know, issues associated with bias? So for example, if people are uh, being allowed to express themselves in the way they want to express and otherwise how the organizational hierarchy looks like, right? So that's, uh, uh, there's, a, there's an organizational hierarchy and there is a real hierarchy how uh, is portrayed within the organization, how people network with each other and how we can improve that to bring it more open openness uh, to that uh, to that environment so that's another of the i think areas of interest uh yeah yeah i think beyond uh, like the, the the biases and you know the the i think it's an important uh you know i guess it's a dni topic but it's just a management topic better management i mean it, it, there's it's just a fact that there's a lot of people that are managing other humans that are uh, should never have been put in charge of other humans. There are just because you're technically competent, you're the best. You doesn't mean that you should now manage human beings, other people, uh, and that's kind of a hard lesson that have been you know, learned in a lot of organizations. But where you can get guidance, um, where the technology can actually help, where if it starts to understand. Um, let's say I'm a, a manager with 10 direct reports. If it starts to, to based on the, the, the work patterns and the communication patterns and the style and the language used, and it can identify and it understands that, uh, you know, one of my direct reports is more of an introvert. It is more data oriented. And another person that is, uh, it seems to be less detail oriented, but is very collaborative and idea driven and that side of it that you can't measure those people the same way uh, and find success in managing that team. That you have to, it's based on that relationship. But the more, and I'm not saying that AI will ever uh, uh, replace the need for the human interaction of a manager and, and direct reports and, and the relationship aspects of it. There's a lot of dynamics there. But the more that it can go and put pick up on those nuances and be able to provide you know, uh, suggestions too, and, 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 you know, and difference between and automate on that, I think we're going to have happier teams, we're going to have more, you know, higher functioning organizations, um, the more that it can provide that, that kind of practical help for management for organizations. I think it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's, uh, yeah. I, and, I, and I know that we're, we're, we're kind of over, I do have a final question for you, which I know that uh, around this topic, it's all on a lot of people's minds. I'd say most people that are watching this have this is um, when will robots take over? Is it five years from now, 10 years? When will AI become sentient? When will, will there be like that moment? What is it called? It's the, it's the, the moment when it becomes self-aware and then it, it, it uh, destroys all of us. How far are we from that? <laughs> I'm working in my basement on that project. In China. <laughs> so that, that's a that's a question actually put to get, put to the I think NIP uh, near IPS uh, uh, conference. It it has a it has a historical name which uh, is not appropriate, but because I always used to refer to that. But it's called near IPS. It's one of the largest conference uh, yeah. in the world. It's uh, uh, for new network, and I think uh, the attendees were asked this question. So artificial general intelligence is what you are referring to, AGI. Um, so AGI, when would become sentient? I guess is uh, <laughs> when when they can do general in intelligence part of the things. So so people think like about thirty five years, or there, there's a whole range of different questions. Uh, right now, you know, it's uh, basically automation on steroids. So what we are doing in AI and machine learning is automation on steroids. Yeah. But I hope that the by that time we have the fairness, the reliability and safety, the privacy and security, inclusiveness transparency and accountability. These are the six key principles Microsoft has for, for AI. I hope by that time we have all of these in place so you don't have to be scared of uh, them taking over, but rather having human in the loop. So building upon what you said earlier is uh, in terms of uh, context of uh, how humans interact 
and if somebody's an introvert versus somebody's extrovert and what kind of medium of conversations are and uh, should be provided automating that with human in the loop would be really helpful the human in the loop is the ultimate judge of that thing because if you uh, create measures around these things without having that human insight into that i think from social aspects it's, it becomes a recipe for not so good things Uh, right. But in in general, I think that's uh, that's like why the fairness that the six principles Microsoft has presented. I think that these are really important to reiterate in terms of like having the fairness, so it treats the people fairly, reliable and secure, so it doesn't uh, act weirdly when there's adversaries or attacks. It's private, so it, it uh, respect the privacy cons- considerations you put in there. It's inclusive, it's transparent, so there's no black box algorithms around there, so people can actually use that. And it's accountable, so it's uh, so that in that case, you know, the whole robocalypse you are predicting wouldn't happen. Hopefully, yeah, that's right. All right, so we'll uh, if if it happens, I'm coming back to you, and I'm I'll you know, <laughs> what what's going on here now? <laughs> We have a lot of the smart people who are actually uh, you know say that this is a uh, one of the biggest threats, including uh, Bill Gates, including Elon Musk, including Stephen Hawking. And they consider it, and I, I think their consideration and uh, challenges they propose are real because, like, think about the from autonomous drones all the way to uh, having the bias propagation in AI. There's tons of different bad use cases around because there's again also tons of uh, all good use cases around this. And right. in humans, we are perpetually optimistic. So we try to find the good, and we are also very not very uh, forward thinking either. Well, and that's why if people get a little too overly optimist, optimistic and excited about the technology and, hey, we're going to live in a life of luxury once it's all just kind of running in the background, one, you don't understand human beings if you think that's ever going to be the future. Um, but two, just go watch that episode of Black Mirror with the robot dogs, the <laughs> autonomous dogs. That'll freak you out enough to say, like, no, there need to be, <laughs> there need to be you know, re- restraints there in, in what we do. And yeah, ethics in AI are certainly important. So, well, Anand, really appreciate your time today. People want to find out more about you, get in touch with you. What are the best ways to reach you, to find you? Uh, my Twitter handle, Adnan Masood. You can DM me there or you can uh, adnanmasood at gmail.com. Uh, that's the uh, best way to reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn, um, an active blog where you can uh, reach out to me. But really uh, glad to be connected with you, Christian. Uh, really glad to become an, a really regional director and a part of a smart people community like yourself. Yeah, welcome. So, well, despite, I'm, the, the, despite the fact that I'm in the program, it's a great program to be a member of. But it's, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, just get ready to drink from the fire hose with those DLs. I know. It's, that, it's a daily thing. thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Get ready. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, well, thanks a lot for your time today. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.